again, my name is Chris. It's been a while since the introductions <laughs> with the State Museum. And really what uh, one of the other things we want to do, especially with this kind of everything that's going on and everything being up in the air about how schools are going to come back um, and uh, what, ha what happens when you get back into school, we just wanted to share some of the resources that we have that are available to you guys to use uh, in your classrooms. And I'm going to um, focus really more on uh, kind of things that'll help during this time period where maybe you won't be able to take um, a field trip or things like that, or you can't do large groups and you need to find more things to do in your classroom. This is the uh, Tennessee State Museum's website, tnmuseum.org, um, and it is kind of our landing page. So any information you need about the museum, this is a really good place to go. But I'm gonna focus on two different uh, places here, the Education tab and then the TSM Kids tab. So just to start off with the Education tab, this is stuff designed specifically for educators and students. So on-site field trips, um, if you, you guys are familiar with the process, if any of you have ever taken a field trip with us. Um, those are, it. we do have a, new, a newer building. Um, it's only been open a little over a year, I'm getting close to two years. Um, so field trips, we've kind of been adjusting them to fit our new space. But like I said, that's not really where we wanna to focus today. Uh, I wanna to focus more on some of the newer stuff, digital learning. We actually have um, created digital programs that can be done in your classroom. As a matter of fact, here's Jennifer, who you saw earlier, uh, and our outreach coordinator, Katie, uh, doing a digital program. Uh, you can see they're kind of in front of the camera there, up in the galleries, dealing with suffrage, the topic we're talking about today. Um, so those digital programs can be signed up for, and we can do those in your class, and we're very flexible with those. So if you have five classes um, and they're, you know, 30 to 45 minutes each that you can get into some of this stuff, then we might be able to spread it out over a couple of days or do it uh, one day multiple times, that kind of stuff. So we, uh, these allow us to be very flexible and work with your schedule. Our digital programming falls into three types. We have mystery artifacts where we focus more on artifacts, first people, life on the frontier, and civil war medicine. Um, you can see, oh, and turn of the century, I forgot we added one. And what we, we do with those is we kind of show you artifacts from our teaching collection. And we do very similar to what we just did with the political cartoon. We kind of try to analyze each of those artifacts as a primary source. And then at the end, we try to figure out not only what the artifacts are, but what they tell us about history uh, during these various time periods in Tennessee. Uh, the most popular one we've done so far has been the interview with a historic figure where we have our educators um, basically take on a first person persona in costume and your students are reporters who are interviewing them about that historic time period. So, and we have several of these, Long Hunter, Ann Cockrell, Civil War soldier, suffragist, uh, Cornelia Fort, Oak Ridge worker. Each one of them comes with a packet of information that you can download. Uh, the first couple of pages are all about how you're going to connect with us. They give you the basic instructions. We do use WebEx for this. Um, and it kind of instructions on what you're going to see in this packet. But each packet is going to contain a couple of graphic organizers to help get you guys, your students, set up and organized before they go, kind of put their minds in the right place for the activity. Um, so if you want to use this as a writing uh, activity as well and have a writing assignment at the end of it, this would help you with that. We also include primary and secondary sources um, about the topic, so your students can kind of skim over these, go over them, and be uh, a little bit informed before they get going. And that helps them come up with questions, because since they are the reporters, the, really the goal is we want them to come up with as many questions as possible. Now I'm going through these pretty quickly. Uh, you can get on our website and download them and take a look at it yourself. You don't have to sign up for the program to get these, they're already available. You know, your basic KWL chart before you get started. Uh, now we do want them to come up with their own questions, but we do provide questions as well. We know sometimes it's a little harder to get uh, them to participate or there's just a lull in the conversation. These would be available so that you could throw out and our educators can kind of jumpstart the conversation again, hopefully uh, with a little bit more uh, 
hopefully that'll get your students a little bit more engaged and get them back going. And then we have where our information and everything comes from as well. So you can take a look into that uh, and see what's available. So that's our interview with a historic figure. And we also have a mystery Skype. Uh, we actually do it through WebEx, but if you've ever done the mystery Skype program, it uh, has more geography based activity where you wouldn't actually tell the students where we are. You don't tell them we're the Tennessee State Museum in Nashville. And what they have to do is they just know we exist and they have to figure out where in the world we are by asking yes or no geography questions. And we turn around and do the same thing to the students. We try to narrow down where you guys are from. Um, so they have to be able to ask and answer those. So this is a digital offering that we have uh, that is available. You guys, when you go back into your classrooms uh, at the beginning of the school year, this is something you guys could do in your classroom. And most of them are designed to be about 30 minutes long. So it should fit around your schedules pretty well. We do have our traveling trunk program. Uh, I'm gonna mention that briefly. Uh, some of you are probably familiar with it. Um, hopefully several of you have used it. It's been very, very popular. I am gonna say right now, just in an abundance of caution, that program actually is paused for now. Uh, we just, you know, with everything going on, we didn't wanna be sending things out across the state um, that could, you know, possibly, uh, end up in your classroom and create a situation we don't want where maybe someone with the virus is exposed, they touch the trunk, we don't find out about it. So for the time being, that one is paused, but we will uh, be bringing that back. Just kind of keep an eye out on our website. So that leads me over to the other side. This is something we've been working on this summer while uh, we've kind of been working from home and the building itself has been closed, the kids page. Now this is designed for kids in general, but uh, also students are in that batch. So we have a couple of different things. Um, we have the junior curator blog for very young kids, color our collection, jigsaw puzzles, and we have video story times, uh, which is one of our educators reading a book, a uh, kid's book. So you can download those and there's an activity that goes with it at the end. I'm gonna focus on the curator, junior curator's blogs at the moment. Um, our educators have been writing a bunch of history um, type blogs that are targeted at, as far as reading level, they're targeted basically at fifth grade. That's what we're shooting for. But we are doing designing these for really third to fifth grade. And these are going to co cover a bunch of different topics in Tennessee history. Um, but they take a couple of different forms. For example, um, you know, you can be an oral historian. This is one Jennifer just uh, wrote. And it just talks about why oral history is important. It doesn't really get into a specific topic, but Jennifer um, interviewed her grandmother about what life was like at school. So there's a connection your kids can relate to. Um, we have one about Ida B. Wells that was posted. This one's a little bit more based on a specific history topic. And as you pull these up, you'll see there's a, oh, this is one of mine actually. Uh, you'll see these are, have some of the artifacts from our collection, like this portrait we have. There's the history writing. We try to keep these below about 700 words, so they're not too bad. We have a vocabulary mixed in there, comprehension and analyzation questions for each one of them. An uh, activity that you could try at home or in your classroom or places where you can find more information about the same topic. And then we have the standards um, that they hit as they come through. Now we have several of these up. Some of them are a little more interactive where you get to take a quiz through Google Forms and things like that. But if you're ever curious, you can always come up here to the search bar and type in, uh, since we put the standards on them, you can type in the standard that you're looking for. Fifth grade, we just had statehood not too long ago. The statehood standard is 5.36, I believe. Type that in, hit search, and sure enough, we have a junior curator blog that ties into that. Um, So here's a blog on how Tennessee became a state. So you can do that by, uh, you can actually search by standards and find those as well. Um, so that's information you would be able to pull up in your classroom at any time. We are also um, doing a Junior Curators Live program where every Friday for this, uh, this past month, we just kind of piloted it. And at 10 o'clock we get on live and Kids can sign in and we do kind of an interactive um, 
talk on various topics. Uh, this Friday, as a matter of fact, we're doing prehistoric Native American um, stories, and we'll show off some artifacts that we have, but we want it to be interactive. We're, we're asking questions, they're engaging and answering, they're asking us questions that we're able to answer as well. So um, we're expanding that, and uh, that's something that we're gonna continue and carry on through the school year also. Uh, it will be a little harder, I know, for you guys in the classroom to be able to be at a set time, stop everything and go check that out. But if you're available to, uh, we invite you to, and we're gonna start recording them as well. So you'd be able to pull them up and at least watch them in your classroom if that's something that would help enhance your lessons. All right. Um, those are basically, I would, like I said, I wanted to focus more on the digital content, the stuff that you could use in the classroom. Um, so that's really what I wanted to put forth. Uh, if you guys have any questions about any of those, Feel free to throw those in the chat. Um, we've got a break coming up next, and I'll be here and I'll be able to answer those kind of as we go, or you can catch me during the break as well. Is there anything else? Any other questions uh, before we hit that break? Back. Uh, my name is Jeff, and uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker. Dr. Miranda Fraley Rhodes is going to uh, join us today. And she's going to talk about a, an ex exhibition that we at the State Museum are very, very excited about. Uh, it was scheduled to open back in March. Uh, as we know, things have changed. So uh, we are continuing to get it on track to, uh, to open very, very soon, as soon as we get back in there. But it's going to be, this will be the landmark exhibition for Tennessee as it relates to um, the commemoration of the suffrage. Uh, suffrage uh, centennial. The title of it is Ratified Tennessee Women and the Right to Vote. And uh, Dr. R uh, Fraley Rhodes has done a phenomenal job researching, doing deep research, and making sure that this thing is completely statewide. It is a statewide story. And so I, I'm going to bring her on. Uh, Miranda, uh, if you're ready, uh, she's going to share with you uh, Ratified Statewide, you've been working on. Thank you, Jeff. It is wonderful to be here with everyone today. Thank you so much for including me. Um, I'm going to start to share my screen here. So today I'm going to share with you some information about our ratified statewide uh, online exhibit, which is a component of our ratified uh, suffrage exhibit projects. And this is now available online at the museum's website for your use. And um, uh, my presentation will also include just a little bit of information regarding the context for this. And at the end, I'm going to demonstrate how the exhibit works because it's interactive. So um, one of the things I really wanted to share with guests in this exhibit was that women's participation in public life was debated by Tennesseans throughout the state. Um, this was really a big topic of conversation, a big topic you'd see in the news during the late 1800s and early 1900s. And one of the things that we hope our online exhibit will accomplish is to really show that Tennesseans had different opinions on women's roles and suffrage. And um, uh, shown here in this photograph is Juno Frankie Pierce who was a suffrage leader in Nashville. So um, during this time period, late 1800s, early 1900s, Tennessee women were going into the public more and more. And on this slide, I just list some of the ways that they were doing that because we're really looking at women's political activity broadly. Um, so you'll see lots of different kinds of things included in our online exhibit and eventually in our exhibit at the State Museum. So Tennessee women were very active in the temperance movement and the Women's Christian Temperance Union 
their chapters included um, African American women's chapters. They included chapters that were white women. It, it was segregated, but that group encompassed a lot of women throughout the state. There were many other women's clubs as well. Uh, Tennessee women were very active in education reform. Increasing numbers were joining the workforce, um, doing paid labor. Um, Tennessee women were active in the populist movement. We have them speaking out about their condition on farms. Um, and throughout the state, many women were involved in the World War I effort, contributing to the war through their labor and in many different ways. And of course, um, also the suffrage movement, which um, by the 19 teens had really become a statewide movement. So um, in this exhibit, we want to provide a story for every Tennessee county about women's political activities and related debates. And there's all kinds of different stories that show multiple perspectives. And um, so for your county, you will find a story on this online exhibit. And I'm going to share with you some examples of the kinds of stories included in our online exhibit. And we start pretty early. So um, by the 1830s, Tennessee women were submitting petitions to the state legislature. Um, some of these petitions focused on temperance initiatives, and they'll talk about um, uh, situations in their communities and laws that they think benefit um, the people that live there. And it's really interesting to look at these petitions and see all of the names on them are women, right? And this particular one is, is from Cannon County and this is featured a story on our exhibit. Um, we also talk about what women were doing um, in suffrage leagues. Now, Memphis has the honor of being the home of the first Tennessee Suffrage League, and it was really the heart of the suffrage movement early in its time in Tennessee and continued to be very active. And um, the woman pictured here, uh, Liddy Merriweather, I wanted to share with you a quote that she published in the late 1800s talking about why did women want the vote? And she wrote, quote, we taxpayers claim the right to representation. We married women want to own our own clothes. We married breadwinners want to own our own earnings. We mothers want an equal partnership in our children. So many Tennessee suffragists were interested in a variety of issues that were important to women's lives. African-American women, many African-American women were interested in gaining the right to vote. However, they experienced a lot of marginalization within the suffrage movement nationally and uh, within Tennessee. So it's really important to talk about their experiences within the movement. Um, many African-American women participated in the movement for the vote through African-American women's clubs, which there was an extensive network of African-American women's organizations. But during this time of segregation, um, African-American women tended to be excluded from many suffrage organizations that were primarily white women. Um, but that doesn't mean that they weren't active in the suffrage movement. And one of the things that I've tried to do in working on our exhibit project is look for African-American women's stories in the suffrage movement. And um, this image is Virginia W. Broughton. She was a leader in the temperance movement in Tennessee and also very active in women's religious organizations in the state. So 
by the about 1915, the suffrage movement in Tennessee had undergone a great expansion. And Catherine Kinney, who is shown here, was very active in that expansion. So um, there, there were over 70 documented local suffrage leagues in Tennessee, plus many other women's organizations that supported suffrage. Over time, there were multiple uh, state suffrage leagues, so it's so over overarching state leagues, and um, women in Tennessee were also associated with national organizations, different national organizations, both the National American uh, Woman Suffrage Association and the National Woman's Party. There were also certainly anti-suffragists in Tennessee, and the woman pictured here, um, Josephine A. Pearson, she was the leader of female Tennessee anti-suffragists. And so we try to encompass lots of different viewpoints in our online exhibit. You'll see some anti-suffrage viewpoints there as well. Um, so I wanted to share with you um, some different things that are in our exhibit. And here is a very interesting anti-suffrage viewpoint. So Mrs. Campbell is the owner and the editor of the Newport Plain Talk newspaper. But she writes that basically uh, her newspaper does not support women gaining the vote. But they d the newspaper does support a recent law which gives women the right to do business in their own name. Because business is not contaminating to women while politics would be. So lots of different views on what women should be doing. Clara Cox Epperson published a front page editorial in the Putnam County Herald in which she talked about why she didn't think women should have the vote. Her father had actually been a politician and she talks about how that impacted her family and she was opposed to women getting the vote. Um, so, suffragists are working against a lot of arguments that are out there being made actively by anti-suffragists and that are in uh, their culture. So, one of the things the exhibit does is explore some of the strategies that Tennessee suffragists chose to use. And um, they were very much dependent upon their sense of the situation in their communities. And Tennessee women were among movement radicals, moderates, and conservatives. So among Tennessee suffragists, they had a lot of different approaches. And by looking at their strategies, we can see how women are using their creativity to promote the suffrage movement, and you will notice significant links to the suffrage movement and schools. So that is highlighted in this exhibit and will hopefully be intriguing to your students when they see things are going on in the schools and with, with students. So um, the lady shown here is Mary Wilson McTeer. She was a suffrage leader in Maryville. And um, she had uh, both local um, roles. She was the president of the local suffrage league and she served as an officer of one of the state suffrage organizations. And she requested that when she passed away that she be buried with yellow and white suffrage emblems. So symbolism was very important to Tennessee suffragists. They took that seriously, and that is a, a topic that might be interesting to explore with your students. Giles County had a lot of different suffrage activities going on. So there was an adult women's suffrage league there was a suffrage club at the high school for local students and um, at Martin Methodist College. They also had a suffrage league. 
And um, some of the suffragists actually held their meetings in the Giles County Courthouse, which shows kind of their stature within the community. And one of the things they did was visit their neighbors and they made notes on the opinion of each family on Votes for Women. Now in Shelbyville, suffragists encountered a lot of opposition. And um, this quote features, um, a, this is from a report by suffragists in uh, Shelbyville who were led by Juliet Ryle Ashley. And they recognized the conditions in their community and some of the stereotypes that were negative about suffragists that they were facing. So they really carefully targeted their strategies to their local conditions. So they didn't have parades in Shelbyville. Instead, they worked with the schools. They did things like essay contests. And um, they uh, basically put forward um, suffragists as candidates for their local board of education. So Jackson suffragists were very active and um, they participated in fairs and they also hosted one of the state suffrage leagues meetings in Jackson. So at, at county fairs, at regional fairs like the West Tennessee Fair mentioned here, um, at state fairs, suffragists would have booths where they shared literature with the public and tried to get out the word about their movement. In Knox County, um, Lizzie Crozier French, a very important suffragist in Knoxville, helped to pioneer street speaking, basically where suffragists would go out on a street corner and uh, talk about votes for women. And this was uh, remained controversial, uh, the idea of women speaking on a public street like this. So this was quite a daring thing to do, even in 1917 in Knoxville. In Dixon Springs in Smith County, the suffragists there focused on public awareness about suffrage and also getting in touch with their congressman, um, Mr. Cordell Hull, who actually tended to be an anti-suffragist, but um, this didn't slow them down. Um, they uh, told him constituents there were interested in votes for women. In Gallatin, they held a special event in favor of, of obtaining votes for women through a federal constitutional amendment at Central High School. And it, it was noted that both men and women participated and they had a good audience. So here's an example of how the schools were involved in the movement. So, in um, August 1920, Tennessee became the final state needed to ratify the 19th Amendment, um, which was really a momentous event. And one of the things that people wondered was what came next? Because there was a lot of uncertainty about women, about how women voters would act. How would they use their vote? what was going to happen now that the amendment had been ratified. And this is something that we explore in our online exhibit and that we'll also explore in our um, paper exhibit at the museum a bit later when that opens. So um, we look at some of the reactions. In Lewis County, um, their newspaper basically said, um, uh, watch out politics, uh, now women can vote, and um, they're about to clean up the system. That had been an argument in favor of women gaining the vote, that they would help to uh, basically improve politics. And here we see the Lewis County Herald uh, coming out very much in favor of women's political activities. 
um, women also gained elected office. So Anne Lee Worley, um, she was elected as a Tennessee state senator. Her husband had been a, a state senator, he died. A special election was held to fill his seat. Her opponent was actually another woman. So there were two women candidates running to fill his seat. And it's kind of ironic because um, uh, Mr. Worley had been a staunch anti-suffragist and his wife is elected to secede him in the Senate. And while in the Tennessee Senate, she sponsored legislation that would remove obstacles to women holding office in Tennessee. So um, she had very much an impact on uh, Tennessee women in politics. Now, just because women were gaining new opportunities, it didn't mean that they stopped working in their communities to benefit their neighbors. So women continued to participate in lots of, of women's groups and community organizations. For example, in Crockett County, African-American women were very important to the effort to help raise money to build Bell's Consolidated Rosenwald School. And um, their donations were critical to that school being built. So the stories of Tennessee women and um, their community lives, they continue on both through the vote and through other means. And I wanna invite you, if you have any questions that I can help you with, um, uh, please feel free to email me. And um, I'm glad to um, assist you. And I hope that you'll find this exhibit helpful in your classroom. And now if you'll pardon me, I'm going to jump from my PowerPoint to the exhibit itself on the museum's website. So I'm going to have to stop sharing and then share again. Okay, so I wanted to show you a bit about how the exhibit works on the Tennessee State Museum's website. So here it is, ratified statewide. And the exhibit is presented as an interactive map. So basically, what you do is scroll over the county, and you click on the county that you'd like to look at and you'll see a story about that county below. And um, we've been working on images. Eventually, every story will also have an image. Um, a, a few don't now, but that's in process. So here's a story about Cumberland County. And um, it was really fun to do the research for this. This was very much a team effort. I'm so grateful to an excellent um, student intern that helped with this and other staff members. And I wanna say thank you to the Tennessee State Library and Archive staff who helped us with a lot of images and um, other resources for this. So you'll see them mentioned frequently. Um, and it, it, it's kind of fun, hopefully, to just sort of look through. So um, this uh, story on Hitman County talks about a suffrage rally, and that led to the formation of a suffrage league. And it was really interesting um, to really research all these different counties and learn more about what was happening in them. In Lexington, we have a local suffragist, Lillian Perrine Davis, who published in the, the newspaper, um, writing about how, um, you know, suffragists in smaller communities were doing lots of good work and um, they were making a lot of progress. We also highlight women's work in the temperance movement, like here in Franklin County.
we talk about different suffrage leagues established throughout the state. And we look at all kinds of organizations that women were participating in and what they were doing. And you can see um, the pictures really help illustrate and hopefully give students just a snapshot of people in these communities at that at time. And you can see here in Smithville, their newspaper editor was very much in favor of women voting. Um, now, I want to show you another feature of this is the Works Cited page. So if you click on this link here, um, you will jump to the Works Cited page. And um, this shows the source material for the uh, online exhibit. And I want to demonstrate something. Um, we've got some links in here. So here is one of the temperance legislative petitions I mentioned. And you can actually click on this link and it will take you to a TSLA to where that petition is featured on their website. And we really hope that guests will enjoy that. And if you have any questions about the work cited, um, uh, please let me know. Um, I'm glad to, to help you. And um, they'll also show some other resources that you and your students might enjoy exploring. Um, and I, I certainly I wanna thank you so much for allowing me to talk to you today. And I hope that this exhibit will be of service to you. And if I can do anything to help, um, please don't hesitate to contact me and I thank you so much all for your time. All right, uh, Miranda, thank you. That was absolutely fabulous. Um, that is such great deep research that you've done into the statewide story and uh, so, so much needed to as, uh, contribute to the larger story. Um, for those of you, I will plug Miranda again. If you want more uh, Miranda, you can uh, get her on Thursday night. Uh, she is leading um, a four part series of women's suffrage history class. It's an online course offered by the State Museum and Miranda will be leading the final, the last, the fourth class on Thursday night at six o'clock. And I believe she's talking about uh, post-ratification and the decade of the 1920s. So what did that look like? So um, uh, I'll put up the link in the chat box that you can register. It's free, but you just need to register for the class. So um, if you're interested, I'll do that. Um, and uh, that's all I have. I'll switch it back over to Kelly now. All right. Thanks, Jeff and Miranda. Um, that was a great website. I haven't had a chance to take a look at it yet. So I'm really excited to see it. And thank you all for linking to so many of our primary sources at the Library and Archives. We really appreciate that. Um, guys, what I want to do now for like the next 15 minutes or so is we, we start to wrap up, um, up this first day of the Summer Teacher Institute is just to talk to you a little bit about some of the resources that are available at the Tennessee State Library and Archives. Um, you'll see here um, on the screen here, this is our brand new building that is currently under construction. Um, we were originally scheduled to open this fall uh, in November, but due to the March 3rd tornado that came through downtown Nashville, and then also to COVID-19, there is delay in the construction process. So we will not be opening our new building until um, sometime in the spring of 2021. 
So, you know, stay tuned um, to, you know, learn more about when that new building will be coming. We've got a lot of great um, classroom spaces that will be available in that new building and a lot of new tech opportunities. Um, so, you know, we're hoping that we will um, be able to expand our offerings to teachers and students and welcome you all back into the building very soon provided COVID-19 goes away <laughs> um, at some point. Um, what I wanna talk about um, now in um, our little resource session here is I wanna tell you a little bit about what's available for you for use in the classroom from the Tennessee State Library and Archives. And we have, I'm gonna to try to cover um, our website, our DocsBox program, and if I have a couple of minutes to talk real quickly about our student history of Tennessee. But I'm gonna go ahead and click on our website um, and you guys can tell right away that we are part of a greater division um, of the Tennessee Department of State. Um, so you see a lot of things going on here at the top of our screen. Um, there are a lot of things that do happen out of the Secretary of State's office. I'm going to, for the most part, focus on things that are going on under the Library and Archives. Um, and here on our very specific education page that we've created for teachers and students. Um, and if you guys have any questions at any point, definitely drop those into the chat. Casey will be monitoring that and, and I'll be taking a look at it as well. Um, where um, I want to draw your attention first is to the navigation that's over here on the left hand side of the page. You'll see it's pretty easy to figure out, tells you what we've got. Um, our at-home learning page is a page that we put together really quickly um, as soon as um, we kind of all got sent home in March. Um, it's a page that, that includes a lot of um, primary source activities, real easy things for students um, to do at home without having a lot of history background or knowledge, um, but some simple activities for students to use. Their parents could do this with them or you guys could use them in the classroom. There are lots of things for you to explore under there. Um, we also have our Documenting COVID-19 project. Um, I encourage you guys to think about doing that with your students. We are collecting material, you know, we're, we're an archive, so we're constantly collecting material about the experiences of Tennesseans um, across the state, and we definitely want to um, collect information about this very important moment in Tennessee history right now, and American history, and world history, as we're all experiencing COVID-19. So definitely think about exploring that. The next item up is, is a really cute activity, or not cute, because it's about pandemics, but um, it's a really great activity that Casey developed on documenting pandemics that focuses, for the most part, on the 1918 Spanish flu, but also a little bit of yellow fever, um, which, um, you know, certainly experienced, West Tennessee experienced that a good bit. So explore some of these activities that are available for you for use in the classroom. We're gonna be spending the next six to eight weeks really building the site out a bit more. So hopefully there'll be more things for you all when you go back to the classroom. The next tab I wanna click on is the primary sources tab. So I'm gonna click there. And, you know, as Miranda showed you that you're able to link out to primary sources that are digitized and available on our website, you can do so from this page. And this page is going to get you to a lot um, of very student friendly materials. We've spent a lot of time identifying items in the collection that are that are good for students. Um, and, you know, here are the areas of American histories they are typically defined. Um, I'm going to you know, scroll on down and click here on the Progressive Era and World War I page. Um, you know, that's where our women's suffrage material is going to be. As you guys scroll on through the page, you'll see some suggested lesson plans over here on the right. Our lesson plans are written by active classroom teachers. As you keep going, you'll see um, the keywords um, that are available. These keywords come directly from the social studies curriculum standards. I'm going to click here on women's suffrage in the 19th Amendment. I'm going to bring my chat box up as well. Um, so I'm going to click here um, on um, women's suffrage in the 19th. Ah, that is not what I meant to do. Um, okay. So here you guys will see a collection of primary sources. There's 168 items all related to women's suffrage um, that someone on our staff, on our education staff has looked at and said, hey, that's going to be good for classroom use. So as you're scrolling down, you'll see a lot of types of sources, some broadsides, some photographs, a lot of political cartoons, 
We love our political cartoon collection and love working with that out in the classroom. Um, all you have to do, say you're interested in using this image, just go ahead and click on that image there and you'll see that you have this download button over here. All you have to do is click on that. Teachers, you should know that you should always download in the large format, all right? That's gonna give you the best quality, the archival quality scan that we've loaded into our website. So you would be able to zoom in and possibly see what's written on these signs. This photo wasn't, it's not that great originally, so it's hard to kind of read some of that, but if it was, um, you know, if you could see that content, you would be able to scan if you download that large version. Below the item, you'll just find, you know, some additional information about the resource. You'll find, um, you know, the uh, title, description, a historical note. We always try to place um, an item in historical context so a teacher could immediately start using this item in the classroom. Any questions about that as I back out of this site? All right, so the keywords are there. As I mentioned, they come directly from the social studies curriculum standards. You will also notice the standard numbers here below. These are still the 2014 social studies content standards. Um, there are about 2,500 primary sources tagged into our education site. Um, we will need to re-tag them to bring them up to, you know, to the current um, social studies curriculum standards. And so far, we just haven't had time. Our entire education staff is, is essentially here today. Um, myself and Casey, we both work full time. And then Janice Perry, who's with us, um, who works part time um, on education as well. So there are only two and a half positions devoted to education at the Library and Archives. And we just haven't had a chance to get um, to retagging these, but you know, provided quarantine keeps going on, we may be looking at doing that very soon. Any questions about this site? All right, I don't see anything popping up. If you wanted to explore by the 2014 Social Studies Curriculum Standards, all you would need to do is click here on 5.38 or US 18, any of those. I think US 18 is still World War I. Um, so click on those and it'll take you to primary sources that relate to that standard. All right. Scrolling back up the page, I want to talk a little bit about our DocsBox program. Our DocsBox program um, is, is a teaching tool, essentially, and, and I hope some of you may have used our DocsBoxes before. If you have, let us know that in the chat. But our DocsBox program, um, again, a teaching tool that we send out to the classroom, much like a traveling trunk program, it just focuses a little more on primary sources um and you know making those available to the classroom we currently have seven topics um at uh, of you know as part of our docs box program those are all here below um i'm going to click here on this women's suffrage docs box program um and and sort of show you what it looks like this is essentially the women's suffrage docs box um you know, there's a lot of great primary sources that come out. There's some three-dimensional items. There's a video. There's curriculum material. We've already written lesson plans and lesson activities um, for you all to use. You know, as Chris, you know, talked about the traveling trunk program being on pause, so is our um, tr our our Docs Box program. It is it is definitely on hold right now. Um, we, you know, are going to wait and see what happens with schools. We're we're kind of watching the same situation that you all. Um, so that you know we can make a decision about whether or not we can put these back into play right now. Um, our women's suffrage docs box has been free this last year um, to teachers because of this partnership with the official state committee on women's suffrage. Um, so we've been able to provide this docs box for free. Hopefully that will continue. You know, I think there are a couple of things that we're going to have to consider the state budget one and then COVID-19 um, as well as to whether or not that continues for free through August. We, we are keeping our fingers crossed and, and hopeful that it will be um, that case. So if you guys are interested in, in looking or bringing one of these to your classrooms, all you would do is just come to the site, click on the content that you're interested in, you know, scroll on down, take a look for the women's suffrage calendar, see when it's open, and then you're going to click on this request for women's suffrage docs box. And you're going to um, fill out that form. That form's going to go directly to Casey, who you met in our first activity today, and then she'll work with you on getting that set up to come out to the classroom. 
Any questions about our docs boxes? All right, I'll wait a second, see if we see any of those chat um, pop up in the chat. I do wanna mention um, some of these other topics, say you're interested in World War I, there is a fee involved um, for all the topics that are not suffrage. And that's just to cover the shipping. We, we just don't have it in our budget um, at this point to cover the shipping costs for these. Um, but there's a one-time $25 fee per box. Um, and you know, essentially what's gonna happen is, is um, Casey will invoice your school, hopefully, um, and you know, get that fee paid. And then we will send you all the shipping um, material that you'll need to send it back. So when you finish with the box after your two week reservation period, um, you would um, just, you know, pop that um, FedEx label on top of it and let them know that it's ready to be picked up and it'll come, they'll come to your school and pick it up for us. So just as a wrap up, those docs boxes, um, they are, they're typically a two week reservation period. There are seven topics available. Um, all of the topics that are not suffrage um, do have a $25 fee and right, right now um, the suffrage one um, is free and we hope that that will continue. Any questions about that? All right. So the last thing I wanna show you guys on our website um, is our student history of Tennessee, okay? And a lot of you probably know about the Tennessee Blue Book. Um, are folks familiar with the Tennessee Blue Book? I'm sort of looking for some nods on the screen. Okay, so the Tennessee Blue Book um, is a great resource that is produced by the Secretary of State's office every year, okay? And, and it's usually available online. Now, a couple of years ago, I'm one of, you know, the, the department that publishes the Tennessee Blue Book asked us about how, you know, we could make this better, um, more useful for students. So what we did is we hired a middle school teacher, a teacher out of East Tennessee that, that we know and work with a lot. And she essentially took the content for that history section that is in the Tennessee Blue Book and, and rewrote that essentially, um, crafted that for a middle school audience, sort of targeting these fifth grade curriculum standards, the Tennessee history curriculum standards that you all are familiar with. So she rewrote that content um, and we you know, put it all into this website. So I'm gonna click on just the age of Jackson for something different today. So say you're interested in teaching the age of Jackson, you would come to this website and you've got a whole collection here of terms and definitions. And then as you keep going, the content is here again, rewritten for a middle school audience. So the content is here with primary sources that are interspersed throughout. And these primary sources go directly back to our Tennessee virtual archive that I showed you guys that populates our education site. It, it's going to go to the same structure, same format that you all saw from our education page. Um, you know, content just con you know, continues. You can explore um, any number of topics within this. Now, the one thing I do want to draw your attention to is that here just this past winter, we created some assessment materials to go along with this. So you see over here where it says chapter five assessment materials. Say you wanna click on this chapter five quiz, that quiz is gonna open up as a PDF um, that you can you know, use in the classroom. The one thing I do wanna tell you is that we right now have our IT division working on, on developing these PDF versions of uh, this, these quizzes, these assessment materials, that you're working to convert that to um, a part of the website. So what would happen is that students would come here, they would be able to click on a button that says, you know, take this quiz and then take the quiz right there as part of the website. Um, and it would, it would allow you all to get a, um, a certificate of completion for when the students do complete it. They can print that out or save that and send it to you to let you know that the students have completed that. All right, any questions about our student blue book or our resources? I feel like I did that really quickly and that maybe I forgot something. Is anybody no, I think you got it all. You're just really good and speedy at it. Again, <laughs> Holly mentioned, you know, we're, we're still trying to figure out what this next school year looks for all of us. 
Um, and so, you know, if there's anything that we can do and help you out, just let us know and stay tuned on our website um, and emails. We'll, we'll email, email anything out whenever we get a new resource because um, they'll definitely, it'll be a different school year for all of us. Yeah, we've got lots of big plans of things that we want to work on that are, are more digital based um, that hopefully will be useful to you. Um, and, you know, I, I will mention that you all will get signed up for our newsletter. Um, so you'll start to receive that in, fall, in the fall. And as Casey mentioned, any new resources that come out, um, we will make those available to you.